So x-rays are important in the diagnosis of various conditions, including evaluation of chest, breast, bone, and abdominal conditions. They are a form of electromagnetic radiation that is able to pass through the human body and produce an image of the internal structures. These electronic waves are carried by high-energy photons. In patient files and in some literature, the common terms chest x-ray and abdominal x-ray can be abbreviated as CXR and AXR respectively. To create an image, an X-ray beam passes through the human body and some X-rays are absorbed or scattered producing reduction or attenuation of the beam. Think of it like this. The film starts off as a white paper and blackens due to the amount of X-ray radiation it is exposed to. Therefore, tissues with higher density or higher atomic numbers, like bones, cause more X-ray beams to be blocked or attenuated therefore resulting in a lighter gray or white appearance on the radiograph. Less dense tissues and structures cause less attenuation on the x-rays and appear darker on the radiograph. Using this property, there are five different densities that can be recognized on the x-ray, and they include air or gas, which appears black, fat, which is dark gray, soft tissue or water, which is light gray, bone, which is off-white, and contrast material or metals that are bright white. The factors that determine brightness on an x-ray therefore include the atomic mass or density of the tissue, whereby low-density tissues are penetrated more by x-rays and produce films that are darker, or you can use the term radiolucent, and high-density tissues are not penetrated by a lot of x-rays and appear light on x-ray films, or you can use the term radiopaque. The second factor influencing shadow brightness of an x-ray is the thickness of the structure. Thicker structures will appear brighter on the x-ray. The last factor that affects shadow brightness on the x-ray is the duration of exposure. Short exposure will result in images that are too bright, and long exposure will create images that are too dark. Given this background, let's now dive into the basic principles required for interpreting x-rays. Common symptoms due to respiratory disease include cough, production of sputum, hemoptysis, dyspnea or shortness of breath, chest pain. Individuals may have other systemic manifestations such as fever, night sweats, weight loss. Prior to ordering for a chest x-ray, it is important to get a good history and perform a proper physical exam. Some common indications for chest x-ray include evaluation of symptoms such as shortness of breath, chest pain, fever, and unexplained weight loss. Evaluation of physical signs such as hypoxia and an abnormal pulmonary exam. Evaluation of placement of central lines, NGTs, and endotracheal tubes, as well as screening for pneumothorax after lung biopsy, trauma, central line placement, and pacemaker placement, as well as evaluation of pacemaker lead fractures, and the diagnosis of clinical conditions such as chest pathologies inclusive of pneumothorax, pneumonia, COPDs, pleural effusions, and heart pathologies such as heart failure. This is what a normal x-ray looks like. To understand the principles of chest x-ray interpretation, we need to discuss the various projections as well as review the technical assessments of a good x-ray. In general, most chest x-ray projections are taken either posterior anterior, also abbreviated PA, or anterior posterior, also abbreviated AP, as well as lateral. In most conditions, two radiographic views, being PA and lateral, are used to often assess chest conditions. Exceptions where PA view alone would suffice include infants and children, screening examinations for driving medicals, insurance, and immigration, as well as following up some conditions such as pneumonia after antibiotics, metastasis following chemotherapy, and a pneumothorax after drainage. 
A chest x-ray is normally taken erect and in a posterior anterior direction at a distance of about 150 or 200 centimeters. In an erect PA projection, the patient is positioned standing with his or her anterior chest against the film and the x-ray tube lying behind the patient such that the x-rays pass through the patient from a posterior to anterior direction. PA X-ray films are good for assessing the accurate size of the heart due to minimal magnification, sort of like how a projector works. If the screen is near, the image is smaller, while as if the screen is further, the image is bigger. In this case, there is less magnification of the heart because the heart is lying adjacent to the film, and almost its actual size. A PA X-ray also is advantageous because the scapulae are able to be rotated out of the lung fields by moving the shoulders forward. Films can be taken with the patient standing, which we refer to as erect, or laying down, which is what we call supine. Erect films are often done because they can identify gas which passes upwards, for example in a pneumothorax, and would be much more obvious as free gas beneath a diaphragm, for example, in perforation of abdominal viscous. Fluid, on the other hand, like a pleural effusion, are also much more obvious on erect films. An erect posterior anterior x-ray also shows the physiological representation of blood vessels or the mediastinum and the lungs. In a supine position, with the patient lying flat, the mediastinal veins and upper lobe vessels may be distended, leading to misinterpretation. A normal mediastinum may look abnormally wide on a supine chest x-ray. Here is a picture of an erect PA chest x-ray. And here is a picture of an erect AP chest x-ray. This is a picture of one which is supine. Lateral x-rays are helpful in further view of the lungs, especially in areas obscured by PA films, such as the posterior segments of the lower lobes, areas behind the hilum, and the left lower lobe which lies behind the heart on PA projections. They can also be used to further assess cardiac configuration, localize anatomical lesions, seen or suspected on a PA film and pick up on smaller pleural effusions that may not be so evident on the PA film. A lateral x-ray also gives a good view of the thoracic spine. Here is a picture of a lateral x-ray. So far, we have discussed PA and lateral projections. One other projection is the anteroposterior supine projection. In this projection, the x-ray film is placed behind the patient while as the x-ray beam tube is in front of the patient. And the x-rays move from an anterior position to a posterior position through the patient's body. AP x-rays are often done in acutely ill or traumatized patients and patients in ICU and coronary units that are unable to stand for a PA erect film. Do note that the mediastinum and heart appear wider on an AP film due to venous distension and magnification. An AP X-ray is inferior in quality to a PA X-ray. Here is a picture of an AP X-ray. Other projections include decubitus films where the patient lies on their side and oblique views which may be helpful in assessing rib lesions, some pneumothoraces, or to display other chest wall pathologies. Decubitus films are used occasionally in patients who are ill to stand and have pleural effusions or pneumothorax that are suspected but can't be diagnosed on AP films. In order to not misdiagnose a patient, it is important to ensure good technical qualities of an X-ray, which can either make an X-ray a good or bad film. Factors affecting the technical quality include rotation of the patient, inadequate inspiration, and suboptimal penetration. In terms of rotation, the patient may be rotated along three axes, X, 
y, and z. Do note that these are not standardized terms and are only used in this video to make the explanation easier. Rotation along the x-axis is the easiest to spot out. It has the least impact on technical quality of the film. In this film, the patient often looks crooked on the film, and consequences of this will mean that the claustrophrenic angles may not be visible and the gastric bubble and intraperitoneal free air may not be readily visible. Here is an x-ray of a patient rotated along the x-axis. In terms of rotation along the y-axis, the x-ray beams are rotated relative to the patient and the film. The beams of the x-ray are not directed perpendicular to the plane of the patient, but are instead directed upwards. Usually, this is as a result of human error in judging the angle of the x-ray or constraints with the patient or the room. Rotation along the axis will create a lodotic view, in which the lung apices are better visualized, there is diminished view of the lung bases and claustrophrenic angles, a distorted cardiac silhouette, and lung volumes which appear falsely low. Here is an image showing normal X-ray penetration without Y-axis rotation, and here is one showing Y-axis rotation. Notice the difference. Lastly, rotation can occur along the Z-axis. Distance between the spinous processes in the midline and the medial ends of the clavicle is supposed to be equal. If the patient is rotated along the Z-axis, the spinous processes will be closer to the clavicle on the side that the patient is being rotated forward. This means the size and the shape of the cardiac shadow, mediastinum, or hilum may be distorted. Here is an image showing the normal relations, and here is one showing rotation along the z-axis. In terms of inadequate inspiration, Remember, in a patient with normal lung volume, a chest x-ray is taken during inspiration and as such, about 9 to 10 posterior ribs should be visible and 6 to 7 anterior ribs should be visible with the 7th rib passing through the diaphragm. Consequences of inadequate inspiration result in lung volumes that appear falsely low, lung markings that appear falsely prominent, giving an impression of pulmonary edema, and a cardiac shadow and mediastinum which appear falsely enlarged. Here are some images showing this. Sometimes, X-rays can be taken on expiration, which we call an expiratory film. For example, in a case of a small pneumothorax, an expiratory film is taken and in expiration the lung is smaller while the pneumothorax does not change its volume. Additionally, in suspected bronchial obstruction with air trapping, for example, during inhalation of a foreign body and a child, in expiration, the normal lung reduces in volume, while the lung with an obstructed airway remains inflated. The last factor affecting the technical quality of an X-ray is suboptimal penetration. Remember, the X-ray exposure is dependent on the duration of exposure, energy of the photons, and the source to image distance. In practice, almost all non-radiologists and non-radiology technicians use the terms exposure and penetration interchangeably in a technically imprecise manner to describe contrast and or overall brightness. Here is a film of good quality. Here is a film that is too bright. And here is a film that has too much contrast. Notice the difference. The terms underexposed or underpenetrated are frequently used to describe films, though both terms are better applied to the too bright film as opposed to the film with too much contrast. Exposure or penetration of a PHS X ray is considered good when the outlines of the vertebral bodies are visible. Consequences of suboptimal penetration include excessive brightness, which leads to falsely prominent pulmonary markings, diminished brightness, which leads to falsely diminished pulmonary markings, 
and excessive or diminished contrast which may lead to falsely diminished markings, obscuring of pulmonary nodules, and pneumothoraces. Before interpretation of the x-ray, ensure you have a good film so you do not misdiagnose the patient. The following steps can help you judge this. Step 1. The x-ray should have the correct patient demographics, in essence the patient's name, date, age, gender, hospital details, as well as the projection. Step 2. The x-ray should have a marker to guide as to which side is the left or the right. Step 3. The patient should not be rotated. Ensure the patient is not crooked, the film should be properly centered, and you should be able to visualize the lung apices above the clavicles and both costophrenic angles. Ensure that the vertebral spinous processes bisect the distance between the medial ends of the clavicles. Step 4. The film should be taken on full inspiration. On the right, you should be able to count 6 to 7 anterior ribs and 9 to 10 posterior ribs. Inadequate inspiration will show the diaphragm lying at the level of the 5th or 6th anterior rib. And remember, in children, the trachea should be straight. Step 5. The scapula should not overlay the lung fields. Step 6. There should be adequate penetration and you should be able to count at least 3 to 4 thoracic vertebrae behind the heart. An overpenetrated x-ray appears darker than usual, whilst an underpenetrated x-ray appears lighter than usual. And finally, step 7. Ensure that the entire lung fields should be fully visible on the film, including the costophrenic angles and apices, and in this way, you ensure that you have a good film and you can easily interpret the x-ray. Make sure to watch the subsequent videos on our channel these coming weeks on x-ray interpretation. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu, to Zambia and beyond. Until next time, bye-bye.